The sea lochs and estuaries which reach deep into the highlands of Scotland give refuge each year to flocks of migrant seabirds escaping the Arctic winter. Some are seen here only at this time. Others, Widgeon and Dunlin among them, join flocks of their own kind, recently established residents. It took men a long time to be convinced that the ice cap had retreated for good, and even longer to settle this far north. When they did this, the annual arrival of the birds was already well established. We know when the birds will come, with some almost the very day. We know the ones we'll see first, and second, and third. People write books about it. But let's look on these things with some humility. It was from the comings and goings in nature that we learned to mark time, to measure our seasons. Now we know that autumn is with us. Though the Dunlin build up enough fuel in the Arctic tundra for the long flight south, it's all burned up now. They're tired and hungry. To restore their energies, they need rest and food. They wait on the beach, letting the incoming tide bring their meal to them. The Tunstone, aptly named, finds food under the pebbles. Lunch is a lengthy business. The shore feeders mingle together, the gregarious widgeon with waders and geese. And for the geese, the attraction is the long eel grass, plentiful hereabouts. Once this was a land of great forests, but a greedy demand for timber and an often greedier lust for land cleared the hills. Birch and rowan are the first trees to recolonize the clear ground, which suits the red wing, who nests on one and eats off the other. It's a happy combination and has caused a few red wing to become resident here. Their traditional home is in Scandinavia and even further north. These migrants stay or fly south depending on the berry crop. This year, they'll stay. Local birds ignore the Ryan Berry until they see the Red Wing. Then they're quick to learn. First, the bullfinch. Then, the blackbird. Caledon, the forest land. In Scotland, we still, with some irony, call this deer forest. For the red deer was once a forest creature. It adapted to new surroundings and survived. The hinds are wary. The slightest stirring sends them off. In these autumn hills, they can find other, safer pastures. There is nothing harsh in the warnings autumn gives of the winter to come. The highlands are never more beautiful, never more varied. Quiet hints of winter's coming are complete with the arrival of the golden eye. A few now nest in this country, most still take the long flight from the Arctic to find the lochans and the freshwater streams on Scotland's high moors. It's just another loch on the surface, but under these shallow waters there is a hidden world of rich organic mud, supporting a complex chain of plant and animal life a private, distinct ecology. The first chill winds cut the easy movement of the sap through the trees and the leaves, glutted with sugar, grow brown and red and die. Soon, the warnings of winter will grow stronger, 
and the golden eye will sense the time has come to leave and find more sheltered waters. The move's not triggered by the biting cold, it anticipates it. Not a rational decision, but intuitive. Millions of years of learning. The quick snap of the early frost nips the old and the unwary. Each plant and animal has to adapt to survive. It's an inherited response to move and change. The clever little birds and trees and animals don't read the signs and make the necessary arrangements. That's a romantic view, a child's dream. Busy traffic on the frozen lochen. It's not the coot and the widgeon keeping themselves warm. Their movement holds back the progress of the ice. While there's still clear water, they can go on feeding here. These birds work well together. The coot's a diver. He reaches for the bottom. The widgeon eats on the surface. So when the coot dies, run come the widgeon to wait for the disturbed weed floating to the surface. It always comes to an end. The ice, in time, defeats their joint efforts. The beauty of autumn softens its warnings. True winter's arrival brings no mercy. The shoreline can freeze here. Curlew and Dunlin, Redshank and the sharp-billed oyster catcher can no longer reach their food through the frost-hardened mud. They can only sit and wait. Alone on a tree, the redbreast leaves his shivering mate and pays to man his annual visit. The unchanging view of the poet James Thompson. It's not wise to be bold now. This weather has no respect for challengers. Blackbirds cease to fly and shelter behind the slender branches. Weather now dominates the land. Nothing else matters. Winter is not cruel, not kind. It has no feeling. But like all nature, it has its purpose. The snow blankets the land under a protective cover, keeping out the ravages of even more severe cold. Only people see it as cruel. But then, we are burdened by our own ideal, a dream of a warm, ever gentle world. It's hunger that brings the stags down from the peaks. The need to survive is strongest now in him, the great survivor. Still here where once reindeer, elk, and moose abounded, the red deer continues alone. Huge animals couldn't live on the denuded hillsides. The red deer devised an economy for survival. It became smaller, reduced in size, energy sapping antlers. It's still a formidable creature, especially when he's with the hinds in the autumn, and now when he feels real hunger. This is the traditional path for the herd, and the shore measured disdain for the farmer's boundaries. They need to find that place where they can dig through the soft snow. It's a ritual, 
guiding the stags through the gear to the hinds and away again, taking them to the high ground and back to these lower pastures. It works because the young stags learn the hard facts of life while it's still a game. You can only get the buzzard to the lure when the cold is extreme. And it's rare for the normally gregarious rook to scavenge alone. Now there are no easy pickings for the ever watchful buzzard. For once, those sharp eyes have failed to detect anything moving on the land. Movement which betrays the prey to the predator. Nothing lives here. It's too cold and too bleak for life at this height. Nothing lives except the ptarmigan. Safe now in its winter plumage, able to remain absolutely still when approached, he survives where nothing else can. In the Cairngorm, nesting at over 3,000 feet. At Cape Roth, he'll come down to 1,500, but that's much further north and colder. In the Arctic chill, he's happy at sea level. They feed on heather tips where the high winds have blown the snow clear. That's the staple diet. It's a long time waiting for the thaw. Great ice ages shape this landscape. Millions of years of glacial activity. Year after year, the winter takes up the task again, breaking down the rock until it's small enough for the torrents to carry it down to the glen below. On the valley floor, the water eases itself of its burden, and deltas are formed, which in time grow fertile. As the thaw quickens and rocks show through the snow, the ptarmigan makes daily alteration and continues to merge with the changing surroundings. By the time the hills are again bare, he will have completed the transformation to his summer plumage. It won't be so profoundly cold again, not until next winter. The plants and the trees are more sensitive to light than to temperature. The chill of spring does not affect them. can return to their summer nesting places. On the high Scots pines, the heron repair the winter damage to last year's nests. They use the same tree until the droppings kill it off. An odd example of ingratitude in nature. It's getting warm now, too warm for the pupa swan. Soon he will set off again for the Arctic. And a little grebe, affectionately known as the dab chick, returns to summer haunts. The Arctic birds have gone, and from the south, the Slavonian grebe return, a rare bird in Britain. A few nesting in this country are confined to the highlands. Soon he'll start his courtship, presenting fish and weed to his lady. The serious business of life will begin again, but it's far too early for such worries yet. Now is the warm, easy time. The 
days grow longer, one succeeding the other and each offering something new to be seen and enjoyed. Arrivals come from far off places and fresh moorland flowers mark their coming. The long winter can be forgotten. Now is the time to look forward. The hinds make the long trek to the high pastures. They are alert now, the year-old calves at their heels. The stags will follow later. New life is everywhere. The land no longer wild and forbidding, a quiet order everywhere to the daily round. The dramatic change which winter forced even on the ancient rocks is over. The pace infinitely slower. The red-throated diver evolved with feet far back near his tail. Totally efficient on water. On land, he can hardly walk. So he makes a home on tiny islands well away from the reach of his enemies. The land teems with small creatures. The buzzards high in the sky is a sure sign of this. The killer's presence there shows that there's life again for the eye to capture. 